This is basically coming from Coil Master. Today we're going to look at the whole functions in higher maths. Every single thing will be taught here. It'll be a full teaching video, not just past papers. But all the past papers will be included as well. So quite a big and in-depth video for this. Hopefully you find it useful and helpful. If so, give it a like and a thumbs up. Let's get started straight away. So what is a set? Let's have a look. A set is a group of numbers that share some common properties. And here's I've listed some sets here. So the natural numbers are just a normal count numbers, one, two, three, four, five, up to whatever, infinity, shall we say. Whereas our whole numbers we say are all of the numbers, but when we put the zero on as well. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Um, then we've got integers, which include all the negative numbers and the positive numbers, but again, still whole numbers. And then we've got these other ones called rational numbers. Rational numbers, which we denote with a Q, are all integers and fractions. So three quarters, a half, minus a half. Notice integers we denote with a Z. Whole numbers are W, natural numbers are N. And then real numbers are all, basically all numbers that you, you, you've ever come across, including pi, root two, things that can't be written as a fraction. There are other numbers, that's why we call them real numbers. You would learn later on if you did advanced higher maths or further maths that there are something called complex numbers, but we're not going to get, get into that, or imaginary numbers. So we write sets inside curly brackets. A set with no numbers would be a very empty set, so it would be curly brackets and it would be empty. This symbol here means a member of. So in other words, 5 is a member of 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Of course it is. 5 is also a member of the natural numbers, whole numbers, and integers. And the rational numbers as well. It's a member of all those sets. If I write a member of with a line through it, it just means not a member of. So in other words, 5 would not be a member of 6, 7, and 8 because that set has only got 6, 7, and 8 in it, okay? And we're going to look at, in terms of functions, we're going to look at what is a function in a minute, but a function basically is a, is a rule which links one set of numbers to another set of numbers, but only one to one, okay? And we're going to look at what that means now. So what is a function? So what is a function? A function is a relationship between two sets where each member of the first set is related to only one member of the second set. I'll give you an example with pictures here. If I take these two sets, let's call that our input, in, and that's our out, say, then you can see that 10 is going to 2. So if I'm putting 10 in, doing some sort of rule to it, it might be, I don't know what it would be, it might be like dividing by 5, the answer is 2, right? Now for this, for this function here, I'm not giving you the rule, the rule might be some complicated thing, but you can see clearly that every one here, 10, 3, 4, 7, and 5, only give one output. Now that doesn't mean they can't have two different ones can go to the same output, that's okay, as long as these ones here only go to one specific output. What you cannot have, in other words, for not a function, is I can't have this set here and have five going to four, but also going to seven. It can't do it. It can only go to one specific number. Five goes to four, or five goes to seven. It can't go to both, okay? And we'll look at that in terms of actual real examples in maths, okay? So let's have a look at some function graphs. A function is between two sets of numbers where one set, remember, is related to the other set, one to one. So here's a function, because if I take the x-axis, every number on the x-axis gives one answer on the y-axis. You can see that clearly because you go along to any x number and it only goes up to one y number. But it's, it's really easy to see things that are not functions. If I draw a simple graph just like this, without giving you the equation of a graph or anything, you can clearly see that if I go to any x along here, oh, I get two different answers. So it's not a function. I, can, I can't get two answers. I'm only allowed to get one answer, okay? Uh, same with this, this picture here. I've got a circle. If I go along to any x, well, I get two different answers in the y. So that's not a function, right? Uh, these graphs here do have equations. And we can then make them into functions by just saying, well, look, we'll only take some of the values. And we'll look at that when we look at domain and range. So hopefully you're getting an idea of what a function is, at least in a, in a sense. But let's look at some specific things now if we're going to look at the domain of a function. What is the domain of a function? So let's look at this function here. We've got, well, is it a function? First of all, we've got f of x is 3 over x, right? Now, if I draw a picture of that function, I can do that underneath using 
graphing software, you would see that you would get this sort of picture. Now, uh, for NAX, you get these, but as soon as you get to this middle bit, it kind of breaks, okay? Because when I try and divide by zero, three divided by zero, you just can't do it. You could say it's almost infinite, but it's not really. So it breaks the function, right? So every x goes to one answer, except at zero where there's just no answer. So it's not a function yet. But we can make it into a function very quickly by just saying, well, x cannot be zero. And therefore, now it is a function. So we would say that the domain of the function is x is a member of the real numbers. We always say it's a member of the real numbers when because any number it can be, but the restriction is that x cannot be zero. So that is how we would write the domain of that function. The domain is just anything that x can be, the input, the x-axis. But it can't be zero because you can't do anything with it when it's zero. Let's look at a different example. I go along to this function, f of x is 2 over 10 minus x. Well, again, if I was to draw a graph of this, you would see that at the number 10, it breaks because you cannot divide by zero. So when you've got the denominator 10 minus 10 is zero, can't divide by zero, so it breaks. So I could say that if I want to make this into a function, then the domain would have to say that x cannot be 10. So our domain is a set, curly brackets, x is a member of the real numbers, but x cannot equal and there we go, there's our domain of our function. So in higher maths, when we look at domains of functions, we'll quite often have to work out what can a domain be, and we're just thinking, well, what can x not be? And that would tell us the domain. It's usually every number except one or two numbers, maybe. Or it is all the positive numbers and don't include the negative numbers. So let's look at what happens when we divide by zero functions like this. We've got three over x. Well, we already know that you can't divide by zero, so x cannot be zero. So the domain is x is a member of the real numbers. x cannot equal zero. And there's our domain there. Let's look at a second example, two over 10 minus x. Well, to, to do some working to work it out, if you can't, you would just say, well, I can't have 10 minus x being 0, so let's work out when that happens. So 10 minus x equals 0, x should be 0, so that means that we can't have x. So if we just solve the equation, 10 minus x equals 0, that gives you x equal to 10. So that tells you that for the domain, x cannot be 10. So the domain is x is a member of the real numbers, x does not equal 10. And let's look at a further complicated example. We've got f of x is 2x over x squared minus 4x. So the only problem we've got is the bottom bit. The bottom bit cannot be 0, so we just solve the equation x squared minus 4x equals 0. That's a quadratic from National 5. We can factorise by taking a common factor. So we've now got that x times x minus 4 cannot be 0. We're just solving these equations. x equals 0 then if I get and x equals 4. So remember that tells us, we've just solved the equation, that's my working, but that tells us that x cannot be 0 or x cannot be 4. So now writing my domain as a curly bracket set, the domain of the function is x is a member of the real numbers, but x cannot be 0, comma, x cannot be 4. Is it four? Yeah. And that would be the domain of that function. There we are there. Okay, let's move on. Let's look at sums where we've got a square root. So here I've drawn some square roots. Well, if I draw the square root of x, I need to restrict it. So now let's look at some roots when we've got the square root of x, say, then I have to restrict the domain in a certain way because First of all, I can't actually take the square root of a negative number. It doesn't exist unless you get any further maths. So I need to restrict my domain to be x is all the positive numbers. Otherwise, I can't get a function. So my restriction for this would be that x has to be greater than or equal to 0. So our domain would be x is a member of r. x is greater than or equal to 0. Let's look at another example. If I had x is the square root of x minus 4, 
in my function, then, well, this bit can't be negative. So I'm looking at any roots under a root sign can't be negative because I can't square root it. When that happens is when, when that happens is when x is bigger than 4 or equal to. So I'll say x is greater than or equal to 4 is my restriction. So x is a member of the real numbers. x is greater than or equal to 4. Let's look at some further examples of that. So for the domain of a function, for roots, since we cannot evaluate an even root, a square root, a fourth root of a negative number, that's so we'll figure out what square roots a minute ago, but that works for fourth roots, sixth roots, eighth roots, then the domain of functions with even roots must exclude numbers which would have a negative under the root. So let's do some working. We've got function is f of x, so that means that x has to be greater than or equal to zero. So our domain is x is a member of r. And x has to be greater than or equal to zero. Same with the second one, f of x is x minus 4. So we know we're, we can just say that x minus 4 then has to be bigger than or equal to 0 instead of just x. So it's a whole of underneath. So x has to be greater than or equal to 4. So our domain is x is a member of the real numbers. x is greater than or equal to 4. And then the last one, a bit more complicated. We've got f of x is 2x plus 1 over the square root of x minus 4. So again x minus 4 has to be greater than, no, not greater than or equal to 0, and I'll tell you why. Because this combines fractions. The bottom bit can't be 0, so I can't say greater than or equal to 0 because I can't have a 0, but then under the square root side has to be bigger than or equal to 0, so taking the two of them together, the whole thing has to be bigger than 0. So then we just have x is greater than 4, so our domain is x is a member of the real numbers, x is bigger than 4. So with the domain of a function, which is all the, what all the x's can be, now we're going to look at the range. So what is the range of a function? Well, essentially it's what all the y's are. It's all the answers you get once you put your x in. So it's a possible spread of y values. So if I look at some graphs without any numbers or equations yet, if I took this straight line graph, you can see that on the y-axis it starts at 12 and it ends at 24. So the range of that function is between 12 and 24. To be able to write that with maths, you just write 12 is less than equal to y is less than equal to 24. y is between 12 and 24 and including them. Taking this one, if we look at this graph here, well, the lowest point is at 4 and the highest point is at 20. So the graph goes between 4 and 20. So we write that as 4 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 20. Let's look at one other graph. If we look at this graph here, I'll zoom that out a little bit, then you can see that the lowest point of this graph is nothing. But if you imagine that graph continuing on forever, it would go off to infinity. So we can just say the domain of that graph on the y-axis is y is greater than or equal to zero. y is greater than or equal to zero. And finally, let's look at one other graph. Again, we can see that the lowest point on the y is zero, then although it goes quite slow, it is continuing on forever and ever and ever, and it'll just keep getting bigger. So again, y would be greater than or equal to zero for the domain of the function. So again, y is greater than or equal to zero would be the range of the function. So the range of a function is the possible y values, if you're thinking of an x and y answer. So let's look at some examples. We've got f of x is equal to cos x. One way to find the range if, is to draw a graph, if you know the graphs. So if you think of a graph of cos x, it starts at 1 and it goes to minus 1. And it goes a bit like that. So we can see that the y's, the highest point is 1 and the biggest point is minus 1. So our range is... Minus 1 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 1. So our range is minus 1 is less than or equal to f of x, I'm going to say, which is less than or equal to 1. Why f of x? Because the function is f of x instead of y, that's why. Okay, let's look at f of x equals x squared plus 4. Well, we've already seen with x squares, if you square a number, the domain of the function starts at 0. 0 squared, 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared. So the minimum, the minimum value of this is 0 squared plus 4, which equals 4. And then the max is, well, anything. It just keeps going forever. I can take any number I want. As big as I want square, I get a bigger number, add 4. So that means that our range for this function is simply 
f of x is bigger than or equal to 4. 4 is the smallest number, but it doesn't go on forever, it goes on forever. If we're thinking the function of the square root of f of x, what we're saying here is if you take the square root of any number, the minimum it can be is 0, because the square root of 0 is 0. If you square root any other number, you get a positive answer. Now, we know a positive answer, of, of course, something you may know, but if you square root a number, you get a negative answer. But we don't want two answers, remember, because that's now not a function. So we're only taking the positive root. When you see square root on its own, it means a positive root, okay? So the minimum is 0, and the max is, well, infinite again, because the square root of a huge number is still a big number, and then the square root of a bigger, bigger number is even bigger. So our range on this is simply, again, f of x is greater than or equal to 0. Let's look at the square root of x minus 2. How am I going to work out the range of this function? We already know that the minimum when you square root something is 0. So keeping that in mind, our minimum value for this function is going to be 0, then take away 2, which is minus 2. And of course, our max is going to be, well, infinite again. Square root any big number you want, get a big number, take away 2, start with a big number. Take a bigger number, you'll keep going. It'll just keep going forever. So our range is bigger than or equal to minus 2, because minus 2 is our smallest answer. So f of x range is greater than or equal to minus 2. Last one here, f of x is x cubed. So what's the minimum value of that? Well, let's just take some numbers. Let's say we take 8. If we cube root 8, you get, my, you get 2. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. However, if you cube root minus 8, which is allowed, you can cube root a minus, you get minus 2. Minus 2 times minus 2 times minus 2 is minus 8. So for powers where it's odd, it just goes from minus infinity to infinity. It can be as small as you want or as big as you want. It's only for powers which are even where is when your minimum starts at 0. So for odd, your minimum is basically minus infinity, as small as you want. And your max is, well, positive infinity, as big as you want. So you can say your range is between minus infinity is less than or equal to f of x, is less than or equal to infinity. You can put in the square, s square higher maths 2015, paper 2, question 2. The functions f of g are defined on suitable domains by these. First of all, it's a composite function question, but then there's a bit of completing the square at the end. So part A, f of g of x. Well, f of x is 10 plus x, so that's 10 plus g of x. So that's 10 plus 1 mi plus x, 3 minus x plus 2. We need to tidy that up a little bit. So I'll expand the brackets. That's 10 plus 1 times 3 is 3. Minus x plus 3x is plus 2x. Minus x squared plus 2. So that equals 10 plus 3 is 13 plus 2 is 15. So it's 15 plus 2x minus x squared. Or you can write that minus x squared plus 2x plus 15. But I'll just leave it there. Part B, I've got f of g of x equals minus x squared plus 2x plus 15. So taking minus 1 out of the common factor of the first two terms, I get x squared minus 2x. I've still got plus 15 on the end. So that gives me minus 1 x minus 1 squared, half the middle term, and then take away minus 1 squared. I've still got plus 15. So that gives me minus 1 x minus 1 squared, take away 1, plus 15, which is minus x minus 1 squared. Minus 1 times minus 1 is 1, so 1 plus 15 is 16. And that's it in completed square form. C says another function h of x is 1 over f of g of x. What values of x cannot be in the domain of h? So part C h of x is 1 over f of g of x, which we'll just complete the square of, so it's 1 over minus x minus 1 squared plus 16, or otherwise, but the denominator cannot be 0. So we can just write that for the domain, for that to be valid, the denominator 
cannot be zero. So that implies minus x minus 1 squared. So try to solve that equal to zero to see what it, that gives me for it. When it is zero, I can then say x can't be these numbers. So we've already completed the square, so we can just say minus x minus one squared equals minus 16. Divided by minus one means x minus one squared equals 16. Square root on both sides, then you get x minus one equals four or minus four. So that means x either equals 4 plus 1 is 5, or x equals minus 4 plus 1 is minus 3. That means x cannot equal 5, or x cannot equal minus 3, and we're done there. Let's go to higher maths 2019, paper 1, question 12. Two functions are defined as f and g. You have to determine f of g of x. So let's do this. Question A, f of g of x, well that equals f of, well g of x is 5 minus x. So I'm substituting 5 minus x every time I see an x in f of x. So that is 1 over the square root of 5 minus x. And we're done there. Part B, state the range of hours which f of g of x is undefined. Well, it's undefined when either this is zero because you can't divide by zero, or when five minus x is, is less than zero because you can't square root a negative number to get a real value. So we can just write that undefined when, well, five minus x has to be less than or equal to zero, otherwise it's undefined. In other words, five minus x has to be bigger than zero. So we can then just solve that for x, taking the x over to our side, you get 5 is less than or equal to x, or to write that in a nicer way, x is greater than or equal to 5. And make sure you've written undefined when, okay? Okay, SQA Higher Maths 2019, paper 2, question 8. A function f of x is given by the cube root of x plus 8, and the domain is between 1 and x and 1,000, so x between 1 and 1,000. The inverse functions exists, find the inverse function. So part A, we have to find the inverse function, so we know that f of x is the cube root of x plus 8. There's a number of ways to find the inverse function, but most of the time, let's just call that y. y equals the cube root of x plus 8. If I make x the subject, I've found the inverse function. So I'll take 8 over the other side, I get y minus 8 equals the cube root of x. So I can cube both sides to get y minus 8 cubed would equal x. Do not now write y equals x minus 8 cubed. That gives you a mark off. You now just need to say, that, therefore, the inverse function of x is equal to x minus 8 cubed. And we're done there. Part B, state the domain of the inverse function. Okay, so for part B, we know that the domain of f of x is uh, 1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1,000. We can work out the range of f of x. If we work out the range of f of x, that is the same as the domain of the inverse function. So the range of f of x substituting 1 in f of x and substitute 1,000 in f of x. So the range of f of x, so when x equals 1, f of x equals the cube root of 1 plus 8, which is equal to 9. And when x equals 1,000, f of x equals the cube root of 1,000 plus 8. The cube root of 1,000 is 10, so it's 10 plus 8, which is 18. So our range for f of x is between 9 and 18, 
and therefore straight away we can just say the domain of the inverse function is between 9 and 18. 9 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 18 and we're done there. Let's look at some composite functions and doing some actual algebra and maths with some functions now. So a composite function is basically a function inside a function, okay? Let's have a bit of revision for what a f how you do functions at national five level. An example like this would be a function is defined as f of x is equal to the cube root of x plus five, or is f of minus 27. So when you see f of x, x is telling you what your variable is on the right-hand side. In this case, x is here, so I'm cube rooting the thing when I'm adding 5. It could be f of y, then it would be the cube root of y plus 5. It could be f of elephant, then it would be the cube root of elephant plus 5. Whatever is in this bracket here is going to replace this x, so it's substitution. So f of minus 27 is just the cube root of minus 27, because x becomes that, plus 5. Cube root of minus 27, well, 3 freezes is 9 times 3 is 27, so that's minus 3 plus 5. So f of minus 27 in this case would be 2, 5, take away 3. So if we look at some composite functions, which is what we're doing at higher maths, that's a function inside a function. And we're just going to go straight to an example of how you do this, okay? So let's say I had this example. Uh, functions f and g are defined as f of x is 2x and g of x is x minus 3 and they're both defined on suitable domains, we'll always say that in case it's a function where we have to restrict the domain. Find f of g of x and g of f of x. So I'm going to do this really slowly to start with so you can get the idea. So for part a, f of g of x, that just means if I take my f function, I put in g of x. So f of well, g is x minus 3. So I write x minus 3 in my bracket instead of g of x. And then I can write what is f of x, because that is my function. Well, f of x is 2 times the something. The x is just your something, which is inside this bracket. So I can say that that is 2 times x minus 3. And you can then multiply the bracket if you want to get 2x minus 6. And you'll be done there. Let's look at part B over here, which says g of f of x. So g of f of x means to take my g function and substitute the whole of f of x, which is 2x. So it's g of 2x. Well, my g function is x minus 3, so I can think of it as 2x minus 3. x becomes 2x when I sub it in, so I'm done there. Okay, let's look at a second example. Functions f of x and g of x are defined as suitable domains. I've got x cubed plus 3 and 1 over x. And it says find the form for h of x, which are saying is f of g of x. And k of x, and we've got some new notation here, g of f of x. That just means... The same as, if you, if you read it, it means the same as g of f of x. So that's how we change that one. So let's start with h of x is equal to f of g of x. So h of x is equal to f of, well, g of x is 1 over x. So I can write 1 over x instead of x. And then in my f function, being very careful that every time I see an x, I replace it with 1 over x. So I'm just going to write a bracket for the x part, right, 1 over x, that is being cubed, because it says x cubed up here, and then I've still got plus 3. And then I need to fix that a little bit. 1 cubed is 1 over x cubed, and then I've got plus 3. So it's 1 over x cubed plus 3. Or you could, in theory, you could fix that and make that a lot nicer, but we'll just leave it there for now for this simple example. And then at the side, we're going to do g of f of x, so that means take my g and put in the whole of f of x, which is x cubed plus 3. So looking at my g function, it says 1 over x. So that's 1 over x cubed plus 3, because that's now what I'm substituting in, and I'm done there. 
Okay, the next one I'm going to look at is some composite functions with fractions. These can be a little bit tricky, so bear with me on this one. But I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it and hopefully get the idea of it. This would be grade A level. So just jumping straight in an example, functions f, g and h are defined as f of x is x over 1 minus x, g of x is 1 over x, and h of x is 1 over 1 minus x, and they're all defined on suitable domains. So what it means by that is x can't be 0 in this one, one, in this one for instance. X couldn't be 1 in that one. You get the idea. So, part A, f of g of x. We start the same way. Don't be worried by the fractions. f of g of x means take f and put g in, which is 1 over x. So, we'll take my f of x. So, I've got x here. So, that becomes 1 over x over 1 minus, and I've got another x. That's 1 over x. So now, there's two ways you could do this. You could immediately times the top and the bottom by x and see what happens, x over x, because that's times them by 1. Or the way I some usually like to do it is to try and make a single fraction on the bottom. So that's going to give me 1 over x on the top, all divided by, now, a little bit of revision on fractions here, I suppose. If I put this over 1, and times that we get, I get a common denominator, which is x, and then it's going to be 1 times x, which is x, minus 1 times 1, which is 1. I'm just going to go across and across. So I've now got a fraction divided by a fraction. Well, from even National 5 Maths, a fraction divided by a fraction is the same as a fraction times the reciprocal. The reciprocal means flip it upside down. So I'm going to flip this blue one upside down, x over x minus 1. Fraction divided by a fraction. If you divide by a fraction, you times by x reciprocal. And now you can work out the answer because that equals, well, x over x bracket x minus 1. x is cancelled, so that gives you 1 there. So it's 1 over x minus 1. And that's one way you can do it. There is another way where you immediately go back here and times by x over x, but I think it's easier or to understand this way. So that's how I'm going to teach it. Okay, the next one says find f of h of x. So let me just take a note of these. That's going to be part b, f of h of x. So looking back up at my questions, that's f of 1 over 1 minus x. f of 1 over 1 minus x, because that's what h of x is. So then be very careful. And my f, I've got an x on the top, then a 1 minus x on the bottom. So x becomes 1 over 1 minus x divided by, then it's 1 minus x on the bottom, so 1 minus 1 over 1 minus x. I'm replacing the whole x by the whole thing every time. So now I get it to that point. Again, if I've got a full fraction already, I leave it alone. This is not a full fraction because I've got a number take away a fraction, so I need to make that into a single fraction. So I'll do that again in different colour by saying, look, we'll put that over 1 times m together. So that gives me, on the bottom here, 1 minus x. And I do 1 times that, which is 1 minus x, minus 1 times 1, which is 1. So minus 1. So that's my bottom bit. I'll simplify in a minute. And my top is still sitting there at 1 over 1 minus x. So now we can just simplify that. So that equals, if we look at the top, 1 over 1 minus x. All divided by all divided by and then we've got over on this side one minus one zero so you've just got minus x so you've got minus x over one minus x and that means you can times by the reciprocal so you've got one over one minus x times and flip the second one upside down 1 minus x over minus x. And now you should be able to see quite clearly that this cancels with that, because that's a full thing and a full thing. If I just put brackets around them, so they just cancel each other out, which leaves you with 1 over minus x, or to put that nicer, minus 1 over x. And we're done there. Looking the square, S square higher maths 2015, paper 2, question 2. The functions f and g are defined on suitable domains by these. 
First of all, it's a composite function question, but then was a bit of completing the square at the end. So part A, f of g of x. Well, f of x is 10 plus x, so that's 10 plus g of x. So that's 10 plus 1 mi plus x, 3 minus x plus 2. Let me tidy that up a little bit. So I'll expand the brackets, that's 10 plus 1 times 3 is 3, minus x plus 3x is plus 2x, minus x squared plus 2. So that equals 10 plus 3 is 13 plus 2 is 15, so it's 15 plus 2x minus x squared. Or you can write that, minus x squared plus 2x plus 15. But I'll just leave it there. Part B, I've got f of g of x equals minus x squared plus 2x plus 15. So taking minus 1 out of the common factor of the first two terms, I get x squared minus 2x. I've still got plus 15 on the end. So that gives me minus 1 x minus 1 squared, half the middle term, and then take away minus 1 squared. I've still got plus 15. So that gives me minus 1x minus 1 squared, take away 1, plus 15, which is minus x minus 1 squared. Minus 1 times minus 1 is 1, so 1 plus 15 is 16. And that's it in completely square form. C says another function h of x is 1 over f of g of x. What values of x cannot be in the domain of h? So part C h of x is 1 over f of g of x, which we'll just complete the square of, so it's 1 over minus x minus 1 squared plus 16, or otherwise, but the denominator cannot be 0, so we can just write that for the domain, for that to be valid, the denominator cannot be 0. So that implies minus x minus 1 squared. So try to solve that equal to 0 to see what it, that gives me for it. When it is 0, I can then say x can't be these numbers. So we've already completed the square, so we can just say minus x minus 1 squared equals minus 16. Divided by minus 1 means x minus 1 squared equals 16. Square root on both sides, then you get x minus 1 equals 4 or minus 4. So that means x either equals 4 plus 1 is 5, or x equals minus 4 plus 1 is minus 3. That means x cannot equal 5, or x cannot equal minus 3, and we're done there. Point the square, SQA higher maths, 2016, paper 1, question 12. Functions f and g are defined on a set of real numbers by f is 2x squared minus 4x plus 5, g of x is 3 minus x, Part A, show, given that h of x is f of g of x, show that h of x equals this. So find f of g of x. So f of g of x is equal to, so f of x is 2x squared, so 2 of g of x squared minus 4 of g of x plus 5. So every time I see an x, I put a g of x in. And then I now substitute my g of x, so 2 times 3 minus x all squared, minus 4 times 3 minus x, plus 5. So we need to expand our 3 minus x squared, so that's 2 times 3 minus x and 3 minus x, minus 4 times 3 minus x, plus 5. Dealing with all of these brackets, we get 2 times... Well, we've got 3 times 3 is 9, 
minus 3x minus 3x is minus 6x, and minus times a minus is a plus, so plus x squared. Minus 4 times 3 is minus 12, minus 4 times minus x is plus 4x, and then we'll put plus 5 on the end. So that gives me 18, 2 sixes is 12x, plus 2x squared, minus 12, plus 4x plus 5. So that equals, we've got 2x squared, and then the x terms, minus 12x plus 4x is minus 8x, and then the number terms, 18 minus 12 is 6, plus 5 is 11. 2x squared minus 8x plus 11, yep, done. Part B, express h sub x in the form px plus q squared plus r, so complete the square. In other words, so part B, we've got 2x squared minus 8x plus 11, so that's going to equal, well, we take common factor between the first two terms is 2. So that gives me x squared minus 4x. And I've still got the plus 11 hanging on the end. And then we complete the square with x squared minus 4x. So that's 2x minus 2 all squared. Take away minus 2 squared plus 11. So that equals 2 x minus 2 squared, 2 twos is 4, so minus 4, and then plus 11, and then expanding the bracket, we get 2x minus 2 squared, 2 times minus 4 is minus 8, plus 11, so that gives us a final answer of 2x minus 2 all squared, minus 8, add 11, is plus 3, and we're done there. Okay, composite functions. SQA higher maths 2017 paper one, question one. F and G are defined as F of X is 5X, G of X is 2 cos X. Evaluate F of G of 0. Okay, there's a couple ways you can do this. You can find F of G of X, or you can work out G of 0 and shove it into F. I'm going to do it by doing F of G of X. So F of G of X is equal to F of to cos x. So every time I see an x and f, I put 2 cos x. So that means I've got 5 times 2 cos x, which is 10 cos x. And therefore, f of g of 0, subbing 0 into this, you get 10 times the cos of 0. The cos of 0 is 1, so that means you've got 10 times 1 which is just 10, and we're done there. Find an expression for g of f of x for part b. So g of f of x means every time I see a function in g, I write f of x, which is 5x. So it's g of 5x, and g is 2 cos x, so that's 2 cos 5x. And we're done there. Okay, composite functions, SQA, higher maths, 2018, paper 2, question 6. F and G are given by 3 plus cos X, and G is 2X. X is a member of real numbers. Find an expression for F of G of X and G of F of X. So part A, 1, F of G of X. That's F of, well, G of X is 2X. So every time I see a X and F of X, I write 2X instead. So that's 3 plus cos 2X. Nice and simple there. And for part two, g of f of x. So every time I see g and I write f of x for x, and f of x is 3 plus cos x. So it's g of 3 plus cos x. g is 2x, so that's 2 times 3 plus cos x. And we can tidy that up a little bit by multiplying the bracket out to get 6 plus 2 cos x. And we're done there. Part B says determine the values for which f of g of x equals g of f of x. So just make them equal to each other. So for part B, we're saying that 3 plus cos 2x equals 6 plus 2 cos x. And we need to solve for x. Everything over the same side to get cos 2x minus 2 cos x. And then we've got 6, 3 take away 6 is minus 3, that equals 0. So 
cos 2x, we can expand using the start of the formula sheet. We're going to use the, for the 2 cos squared x minus 1 form of it, because we've all got causes for everything else. So that gives me 2 cos squared x minus 1. Take away 2 cos x. Take away 3 equals 0. Or 2 cos squared x minus 2 cos x minus 4 equals 0. So 2 is a common factor in this case, so I can just take 2 out as a common factor to get cos squared x minus cos x minus 2 equals 0. And we can then factorise it because it's a quadratic. So it's 2 double brackets. We get cos x and cos x in the first place. 2 and 1. And we've got minus 1 in the middle, so it's minus 2 plus 1. And therefore cos x equals minus 1, or cos x equals 2. So we've got two answers, but cos x equals 2 has no solution, so we can just write that straight away, because the maximum and minimum value of cos is 1 and minus 1. So we just need to solve the other one. Cos x equals minus 1, so I can do the inverse cos of 1, which is 0 or 2 pi, but then our cast diagram, cos was negative, so it is pi minus and pi plus in these quadrants, x equals pi minus 0 or pi plus 0, which is pi, or pi minus 2 pi is out with our range, and pi plus 2 pi is clearly out with our range as well, between 0 and 2 pi. So it's just x equal to pi as our, as our solution, and we're done there. Okay, composite functions SQA, higher maths, 2019, paper 1, question 12. f and g are defined as f of x is 1 over root x, and g of x is 5 minus x. Determine an expression for f of g of x. So I've got f of g of x is equal to f of, well, g of x is 5 minus x. So every time I see a x and f, I write 5 minus x. So that's 1 over the square root of 5 minus x. And we're done there. But B, state the range of values for which f of g of x is undefined. Well, it's undefined when either this is 0 or negative because I can't square root a negative number. So I write undefined when 5 minus x has to be less than or equal to 0 because it has to be greater than or equal to zero for this to be to work, to be able to do it. So I can take the x over to the other side to get five is less than or equal to x, or to write that nicer, x is greater than or equal to five. Make sure you've written undefined when. It's going to be higher math, 21 people, one question six on functions. F and g are defined the real numbers by f of x is two x plus five, and g of x is x squared minus two x. Find f of g of x, then find g of f of x. Then express g of f of x minus f of g of x in the form a x plus b squared plus c, which is a completely square question. So, part a, f of g of x. Well, that equals f of, well, g of x is x squared minus 2x. So that equals 2, and then there's an x plus 5, so x is x squared minus 2x. But then I've got plus 5 on the end. So that just gives me... Expanding the brackets, 2x squared, 2 twos are 4, minus 4x, plus the 5 on the end. And I've done part A. Part B, g of f of x, that's g of 2x plus 5. So looking at my function g, every time I say an x, I write 2x plus 5. So I've got x squared, so I've got 2x plus 5 squared minus 2 times x, which is 2 in the x plus 5 now. So now I can expand and simplify my brackets. 2x plus 5 squared is 2 twos of 4x squared. 2 fives is 10, so that's 20x, double in it, plus 25. 2 twos of 4 minus 4x, 2 fives is 10 minus 10. Tidying that up, I get 4x squared, 20 minus 4 is 16x. 25 minus 10 is 15. And that's me done part B. Part C says, find an expression for g of f of x minus f of g of x and, and express it in the form ax plus b squared plus c. 
So I need to do g of f of x minus f of g of x. So that is 4x squared plus 16x plus 15 minus, put it in brackets so I don't mess up, f of g of x is 2x squared minus 4x plus 5. So then I can start working on this. I've got each term, 4x squared minus 2x squared is just 2x squared. And then I've got 16x minus minus 4x, so that's plus 20x because of a minus minus. And finally, I've got 15 minus 5, which is plus 10. And now I have to express it in the form a x plus b squared plus c. Well, that's called completing the square. First thing is that's a, I've got a common factor of 2. That gives me x squared plus 10x plus 5. So that equals 2. National 5 completing the square. So a half the middle term, x plus 5 squared. Immediately take away 5 squared. And I've still got plus 5 on the end. So that's 2 times x plus 5 all squared. Minus 25 plus 5 is minus 20. And then just check the form we want it in. We want ax plus b squared plus c. So that's 2x plus 5 all squared. And then 2 20s is 40, so minus 40. And we're done there. 3x plus 5 with the final expressions for f of g of x and g of f of x. And then determine the range of values for which f of g of x is less than g of f of x. Let's get straight into it. Part 1. f of g of x equals... So we've got f of x is x squared minus 2, so we've got g of x squared minus 2, and g of x is 3x plus 5. 3x plus 5 all squared, take away 2. 3 threes are 9x squared, 3 fives is 15 times 2 is 30x. 5 fives is 25 minus 2, so f of g of x equals 9x squared plus 30x plus 23. Part 2, g of f of x. Well, g, our remember, is 3x plus 5, so it's 3f of x plus 5. That's 3 times x squared minus 2 plus 5 so g of f of x is 3x squared minus 6 plus 5 g of f of x 3x squared minus 1 determine the range of values for which f of g of x is less than g of f of x so we're saying f of g is less than g of f. So x squared plus 30x plus 23 has to be less than 3x squared take away 1. Taking the x squareds across, we've got 6x squared plus 30x plus 23 is less than minus 1. So 6x squared plus 30x plus 24 is less than 0. So we've got a quadratic inequality to solve. So let's look for a common factor. 6x squared plus 5x plus 4 is less than 0. So let's look at the roots of x squared plus 5x plus 4. So that factorises to give us x and x. We've got 4 and 1 plus and plus, so roots at x equal minus 1, x equal minus 4, so we can draw a quick graph to show the roots, minus 1, minus 4, less than 0 means below the x-axis, 
under here, well it's under here when it's between these two numbers. So our final answer, minus 4 is less than x, which is less than minus 1. 2023, paper 1, question 13, two functions f and g are defined as f of x is 2 sine x for between 0 and pi over 2, and g of x is 2x for between 0 and pi over 4. Evaluate f of g of pi over 6, and then find an expression for f of g of x. So, we might as well do the first one directly instead of going f of g of x first, but you could have done that first and then subbed it in. So, for part 1, I want f of g of pi over 6. Well, g of pi over 6 is simply 2 times pi over 6, because g of x is 2x. That is pi over 3. So f of g of pi over 6 is just simply f of pi over 3. f is 2 sine x, so it's 2 times the sine of pi over 3. So the sine of pi over 3 is an exact value. If you don't know it, pi over 3 is 60 degrees, so I've got 60 degrees here. I've got, I think, equilateral triangle, so it goes 2, but it's been cut in half 1, and that's root 3. So the sine of pi over 3 opposite over hypotenuse is root 3 over 2. So that's 2 times root 3 over 2, which is just simply root 3 as our final answer. Part 2, determine an expression for f of g of x. So f of g of x is equal to f of, well, g of x is 2x. So that is 2 sine 2x. 2 sine 2x. And we're done there. But B, given that f of p is a third, determine the exact value of sine p. So f of p, part B1, f of p is just going to substitute p in to sine p. But it's told us in the question that f of p equals one third. And therefore, sine p is equal to a third divided by two, which is a sixth. Part two. Hence, determine the exact value of f of g of p. So, p part 2, f of g of p. Well, f of g of x is 2 sine 2x, so f of g of p is 2 sine, just change it to a p. So, 2 sine 2p, well, sine 2p is 2 sine p cos p from the start of the exam paper. So, it's 2 times 2 sine p cos p which is 4 times sine p cos p. Now, I don't know sine p is a sixth. So if sine p is a sixth, if I draw a little right-angled triangle and call that p, opposites 1, hypotenuse is 6. So I can do Pythagoras, 6 squared minus 1 squared, 36 minus 1 is 35. So that side is the square root of 35. So this gives us 4 times the sine of p, which is a sixth, times the cos of p, which is going to be adjacent of hypotenuse, which is root 35 over 6. You may be wondering, is root 35 a simplified third? Well, 4 doesn't go into 8, 9 doesn't go into 8, 16 doesn't go into 8, 25 doesn't go into 8. So no, it's, it's already simplified. So when we just times the top, 4 root 35 times the bottom, 36. Simplify the 4 and 36 to get root 5, 35, sorry. 4 nines are 36. Doesn't look simplified, but it actually is. There's nothing else you can do with that. So we're done there. Eh? Inverse functions. Inverse functions, example 1, f of x is 2 over 1 minus x, and g of x is 1 minus 2 over x. And it tells you that x is not equal to 0, 1, because obviously you can't divide by 0. And then it says find f of g of x, and then state the connection between f and g. So let's start off with that. So part A, f of g of x, with are lots of these now. We've got f of g of x is equal to, well, let's look at f of x, f of... 1 minus 2 over x, because that's what g of x is. And then looking here, every time I see an x, I put this whole thing in. So it is 2 over 1 minus the whole of 1 minus 2 over x. 
and then we need to fix this and simplify it. So let's just do that. So that gives me 2 over, well, expand the bracket, we've got 1 minus 1, and then minus times a minus is a plus, so plus 2 over x. That simplifies to 2 over, 1 minus 1 is 0, so 2 over 2 over x. And we're dividing by a fraction, so we can times by the reciprocal, and I was flip it upside down. So that gives me 2 times x divided by 2, or 2 times x divided by 2 is just x. So we've just got x, and then what does that tell us? Well, we're on inverse functions now. So what you need to know about inverse functions is that if f of g of x or g of f of x, both of them would actually be equal x. If you get x, then the functions are inverse of each other. So all we have to do to say for part b, state the connection f and g, since f of g of x equals x, f and g are inverse functions. And we're done there. Inverse functions example two, a function is defined for all real numbers by f of x is x cubed plus one. And then this time we have to find the formula for the inverse function. Now there's a couple of ways you can do this and I'm going to give you one method at the moment. So I know that f of x is equal to x cubed plus one. So one method is to just say, let's say let y equal x cubed plus one. And if you can make x the subject of this formula, you will have found the inverse function. So let's start doing that. That means that y minus one would equal x cubed, and therefore x would be the cube root of y minus one. Now, you do not then say that x, a lot of teachers will say that you yeah, flip it, so you end up saying that y equals the cube root of x minus 1. Now, that would not be true because you've already said that y is x cubed plus 1. So you just keep that there as you're kind of working to help you get the answer. Then immediately you just say that the inverse function, f inverse minus 1 x is equal to the cube root of, and you just switch the y for an x, x minus 1 and that's you found the inverse function. You could check the answer by finding f of f of inverse and making sure the answer is x, but this will be correct. Paper 1, question 5. A function g is defined on the real set of numbers by g of x is 6 minus 2x. Determine the inverse function for g. So for part a, there's a few ways you can do this, but I like it out the way I do it. 6 minus 2x. I'll just let's say that's y equals 6 minus 2x, and I'll rearrange that to make x a subject. That means taking 2x over to the left, 2x equals 6 minus y, taking the y over to the right. So x is 6 minus y over 2. Splitting that up, that gives me 6 over 2 is 3 minus a half of y. And therefore we can write the inverse function of x is simply 3 minus a half x, or you might prefer the inverse function of x, writing it x first is minus a half x plus 3. Part b, write down an expression for g of the inverse function of x. Well, you should already know that g of the inverse function of x should be x, but let's say you didn't know that, let's do the work for it. So part b, g of the inverse function of x is equal to, well, that's g of minus a half x plus 3. That equals, remember, g was 6 minus 2x, so 6 minus 2 times minus a half x plus 3. That gives me 6 minus 2 times minus a half is plus 1x, minus 2 times 3 is minus 6, 6 minus 6 is 0, so we get x, and there we are. Inverse functions, SQA Higher Maths 2016, paper 1, question 6. F and G are defined in the real set of numbers, and the inverse functions both exist. Part A. If f of x is 3x plus 5, then the inverse function of x. So for part a, I can just write y equals 3x plus 5 and make x the subject. So that means that y minus 5 equals 3x. And therefore, y minus 5 over 3 equals x. Don't now be tempted to write y equals x minus 5 over 3 or you'll lose a mark. Just go straight into, therefore, the inverse function of x equals y becomes x, so x minus 5 over 3. And we're done there.
But b of g of 2 equals 7, what is the inverse function of g of 7? Right, that sounds a bit strange, but this relies on you knowing what this means. If I put in 2 and I get 7, then that means that if I put in 7 in the inverse, that takes me back to 2. So that just means the inverse of 7 is just 2. There we go. Inverse functions s to a high in maths 2017, paper 1, question 6. The function h is defined as x cubed plus 7. Define determine the expression for the inverse function of h. So I can just write y equals x cubed plus 7. And make x a subject. So that means that x cubed is y minus 7. So x is the cube root of y minus 7. And therefore the inverse function of h is equal to the cube root of x minus 7. Again, do not be tempted to write at this stage y equals the cube root of x minus 7 or you'll lose a mark because y is this and not that. So just watch a little bit of notational thing there. Inverse functions s squared high maths 18 paper 1 question 2. g is defined on a set of real numbers by a fifth of x minus 4. Find the inverse function of g. So I can just write y equals a fifth of x minus 4. And make x a subject, so I've got y plus 4 equals 1 fifth of x. Times on both sides through by 5, I get 5 bracket y plus 4 equals x. And therefore, our inverse function of g is equal to 5 bracket x plus 4. Or if you prefer, you could expand the bracket to get 5x plus 20. And we're done there. Okay, SQA Higher Maths 2019, paper 2, question 8. A function f of x is given by the cube root of x plus 8, and the domain is between 1 and x and 1,000. So x between 1 and 1,000. The inverse function that exists, find the inverse function. So part A, we have to find the inverse function. So we know that f of x is the cube root of x plus 8. There's a number of ways to find the inverse function, but most of the time, let's just call that y. y equals the cube root of x plus 8. If I make x the subject, I've found the inverse function. So I'll take 8 over the other side. I get y minus 8 equals the cube root of x. So I can cube both sides to get y minus 8 cubed would equal x. Do not now write y equals x minus 8 cubed. That gives you a mark off. You now just need to say, that, therefore, the inverse function of x is equal to x minus 8 cubed. And we're done there. Part b, state the domain of the inverse function. Okay, so for part b, we know that the domain of f of x is a... Uh, 1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1,000. We can work out the range of f of x. If we work out the range of f of x, that is the same as the domain of the inverse function. So the range of f of x, substituting 1 in f of x and substitute 1,000 in f of x. So the range of f of x. So when x equals 1, f of x equals the cube root of 1 plus 8, which is equal to 9. And when x equals 1,000, f of x equals the cube root of 1,000 plus 8. The cube root of 1,000 is 10. So it's 10 plus 8, which is 18. So our range for f of x is between 9 and 18. And therefore, straight away, we can just say the domain of the inverse function is between 9 and 18. 9 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 18. And we're done there. SQA Higher Maths 2022 Paper 1 Question 3 was a function h is defined as h of x equals 4 plus a third of x, where x is a member of real numbers, and find the inverse function h to the negative 1x. And this is worth three marks. 
This one is a couple of methods you could use, so I'll go through both methods in case you use an alternative method or prefer an alternative method. So let's look at method one. Let's call it here method one. For method one to get your first mark, you would save it h of the inverse function of x equals x. You can get a mark for knowing that if you take h of the inverse, you always, the composite function, you always get the answer x. So there's one mark there just for writing that down. Then for your second mark, substituting into h, you'll get 4 plus 1 third h to the minus 1 of x. And that still equals x. So there's your second mark if you're using composite functions. And then for your third mark, the inverse function, the subject of that. So we'll need to do some work on that, first of all. So we've got one third of the inverse function equals x, take away four, times in three by three then, the inverse function equals three times the whole of x minus four. And we can leave it in that form to get your final mark, or you could have went on and expanded the brackets, but there's nothing to do that. So there's your first method. And let's go through method two for the same question. Okay, so method two is much more common I've seen in the high schools used is where you say that y equals h of x. And that implies that x equals the inverse function of y. In other words, writing y equals the inverse, the function, if you make x a subject, that gives you the inverse function, okay? So we have got y equals four plus a third x in this case and then we would get a mark for starting to rearrange this so you could get a mark for doing y minus 4 equals a third x that's a mark there or alternatively if you prefer to multiply 3 by 3 first or you could have 3y equals 12 plus x if that's the way you prefer to go i would do it the first way but that's the alternative way. Continuing on with the way that I've done it, that's your first mark, then expressing x, making x a subject. So from here, we're going to times through by 3. So we've got 3y minus 4 equals x, or x equals 3y minus 4. There's your second mark there. And then you have to explicitly state what the inverse function is to get your final mark. So you have to then say that your inverse function of y is equal to 3y minus 4. And so for your final mark, your inverse function of x must be 3x minus 4. And there's our final mark there. Now, just a little notes on like, where would the SQA say you can't get marks? So let's look at method two to start with since we're on it. We can start off just by writing this and you will get your first mark. If you, don't, if you, had, if you forgot to write this, we would not take a mark off. Similarly, at mark three, we would accept h inverse function of x is 3x to minus four without you writing this statement first. So if you just jump straight from here to here, that would be fine also. Also, what you would actually get a mark for if you'd made a mistake is if you'd kept it as y instead of x, we would be, we would be quite happy with that and give you the mark anyway, the benefit of a doubt. What we would not allow you to get a mark for, to be very clear though, is if you look y equals three bracket x minus four, you have to state it's an inverse function h minus one. And if you had actually done all this for some reason and not shown any working, not sure why you do that, but if you did in this case, we would actually give you forget free and give you a benefit of the doubt on this question. For method one, if you go four plus a third h to minus one, if you just jump straight to here, we would give you both marks. We'd be fine with that as well. And of course, again, if you just jump straight to here and just got the answer, we'd give you all three marks. So there's your allocations of marks for this question. Method one and method 
2. To question 6, a function f is defined as f of x equals 2 over x plus 3 for x greater than 0, find the inverse function. So what I usually do with these is I write y equals 2 over x plus 3, there is other ways to do these, and make x the subject. So taking away 3, I get 2 over x, multiplying each side by x, I get x bracket y minus 3 equals 2, and dividing through by y minus 3, I get x equals 2 over y minus 3. So then I immediately write down my answer, the inverse function of x is equal to 2 over, now just x minus 3. Make sure you do not write at any point swapping these back to y and x, because then you'll get an inconsistent answer and you'll lose a mark. So now we start looking at graphs of inverse functions and what that tells us. So what I've done here is I've drawn some graphs here. In each of the following diagrams, a function that's inverse has been drawn. And what do we notice about these graphs? Let's have a look. So here's the first. We've got one function, let's say, here. And we've got one function there. And these are inverses. Can you see anything that connects these two lines together? Let's have a look at some curves. Maybe that will help. If we draw this curve, it's inverse is this curve. Can you see maybe if it was a mirror line somewhere? If not, let's look at another one. We've got this curve. And it's inverse is this curve. You can see the curves are very similar, but there's some sort of mirror line going on, and the mirror line exactly is the line y equals x, which we just found out previously. If you do the f of f of minus 1, f of the inverse, you get x. So y equals x makes sense as the mirror line for the function. So you there's that there, that's y equals x, and you can do that across this one. And this is just a quick sketch, of course, but you can see that kind of mirror line going through there. That would be y equals x, and similar for this one. You can see that if I was to reflect the red line and the blue line, you'll get y equals x. So graphs of inverse functions. If we have a graph of function, we can find the graph of the inverse function by reflecting in the line y equals x. So let's take an example. Let's say we have f of x is x plus 1. Well, that means that every time we see an x, add 1. So that would give me 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if we were to draw a quick sketch of this graph, we could have a line a y-axis and an x-axis. I'm not going to plot this exact, but you should be able to see what's happening. If I draw 0, 1, let's say it's there, and then along 1, up 2, and then you would have a straight line going up like this. And I'm going to just know what these points are instead of making this exact. So that's 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, and we'll reflect in the line y equals x, so let's just draw a dotted line to represent that. That's our y equals x. And you should be able to see that if I take this point, it kind of ends up over here. And that point would become, if I do it a different colour, that would go kind of to here. The second point reflecting over would go in and then out, so it would kind of end up there. And similarly, these points would kind of go a line lining up there. So you'd end up with this kind of blue line, which is parallel. And forgetting about what the equation of that line is for a moment, the point is what I'm really interested in. That first point there, 0, 1 is turned into 1, 0. 1, 2 is turned into 2, 1. 3, 2, 3 would be turned into 3, 2. And 3, 4 turns into 4, 3. So in other words, when you find the inverse function, in becomes out and out becomes in. So the y and the x is just switch places with each other. So when you've got a graph of an inverse function, it's quite easy to draw its inverse. So let's take some specific examples. So an example for graphs of inverse functions will be shown as a graph of f of x and draw the inverse function. So all we do is take each point and map its inverse point. So we've got 1, 2. So if we look at 1, 2, we can make sure that that ends up being along 2 and up 1. So that would end up being here. Um, I'm going to draw in the line y equals x just so that we've kind of got that as a guide because remember we're reflecting on that line. So that is 2, 1. And then taking the other point, 0, 1 becomes along 1 up 0. So we could put that on the x axis. That would be along 1 up 0. And then flipping the minus 1 and 0, that becomes 0, minus 1. So along 0 and down minus 1. And we get a, a point round about there. So once you get your points, it's then just kind of translating that graph into what it looks like. Uh, it can be useful to look at where these asymptotes, these are called asymptotes, where it never touches things. So you should be able to see that this one goes roughly about here. 
and keep going down so that'll kind of come in that side so it'll kind of go up along and then kind of go up like that because that one goes up so it reflects and all that goes there so we'll just kind of do a draw and i've just traced it with my laser pointer there so coming along we're turning we're turning and we're going along and you should be able to see once you've drawn it but that is a nice reflection over the line y equals x this is a quick sketch obviously this bit here would be quite vertical but we can that's good enough so we can just note that this one is f of inverse of x and we're done there Okay, we're going to look at a whole bit of graph transformations where graphs move left, right, up, down and get scaled and all sorts. We've done a bit of that in National 5, but let's just do it in higher now. So, here is a note of all the graph transformations that you need to know, just a quick reminder. So, if we add a, a number on or take away, that just moves the graph up or down by that amount. If we times by a number or even a fraction, if we times by a whole number, that will stretch it up. It'll just stretch it and make it bigger. But if we times by a fraction, it'll kind of it'll make it smaller, it'll compress the fraction. If we put a minus in front of the fact of the function, then it literally just flips it upside down. So in other words, it's reflected all of the x-axis. And then we've got these ones. If you've got f of x plus a and f of x minus a, where the a is in brackets, that is a shift to the left and right. Plus shifts to the left and minus shifts to the right. Then we've got a couple of extra ones that you need to be aware of. You know, these other ones, f of ax and f of 1 over ax, as stretches or compressions, essentially, if you if a is bigger than 1, it kind of compresses the graph in. But if a is if it's a fraction, 1 over a, you end up stretching the graph out. And the last one, if you've got f of minus x, that reflects it over the y-axis. So let's just look at some specific examples with this. So example 1 for graph transformation says, Shown as the graph of y equals f of x, sketch a graph of minus f of x minus 2. All right, so let's start this. We'll just draw this nice and big here at the side. So there's a y and x axis. So our main points to consider, we're looking at minus 3, 0, minus 2, 10, and 1, 17. So if we look at what's happening here, the minus in front is telling us that we're going to reflect it on the x-axis. It's going to turn upside down, you can think of it. And the minus 2 inside the brackets tells you you're going to shift the whole graph to the right, not the left. Don't get, make that mistake. You're shifting to the right by two units. So we'll just take each point and turn, turn them into what they would become. So I'm going to start with minus 3, 0 and take a note at the side. So minus 3, 0 goes to... Well, it's shifting to the right by 2, so on the x-axis, that gives me minus 3, minus 2, minus 1. And then we're flipping it upside down, but on the y-axis, that's on the x-axis as well, so 1, 0, so we're still on 0. So that's the first point, and then we've got minus 2, 10. Well, we're going to shift the minus 2 to the right by 2, so that's 0. And the 10 is going to get shifted all the way over the x-axis, so that becomes minus 10. And then the last one, 1 minus 17. Well, 1 becomes 3, because it's shifting to the right, and minus 17 becomes 17. So there's our main point, so we can just note them on our graph. We've got minus 1, 0. We can just put that there. We've got 0 minus 10, way down there somewhere. Let's just put minus 10 here. And we have got along 3 and up 17, which is probably going to be somewhere up here. We'll just note that as along 3 and up 17. And then we'll just be aware that we're flipping this upside down. So if we look at our original graph, it goes up. So it's now going to go down, up, and turn again. So we can just draw that in. We're going to go down here, along and up, and then turn back down. And that's us drawing a sketch of the graph. And we're done there. Graph transformation example two shows the graph of y equals f of x. Sketch the graph of three times f of x, three times f of two x plus one. So remember what's happening here. Let's we'll start with this one. Plus one on the end means you're moving it up by one. Times in by three on the outside means that every number that it gets times on the y axis is times by three. Uh, it's getting stretched up. And then the two x means it's getting compressed in. So in other words, you just half the numbers to pull it in okay so we can think of this in stages we're starting off with f of x and then going inside out 
we've got f of 2x and then we've got 3f of 2x and then finally we've got 3f of 2x plus 1. And we can think of what happens to each of the points. So we've got minus 1, 0. We've got 0, 2. We've got 1, 0. And we've got 3, 0. So when you do f of 2x, well, I'm going to half of the x term, not double it, half it. Because if you think about this, minus a half, if you double that, you get back to minus 1. So it's minus a half, 0. 0, 2. A half, 0 and 3 halves 0. So I've dealt with that 2x. I'm now going to times by 3. Now times in the function by 3 is times in the y value. So I'm stretching it by 3. So it's minus a half stays the same. 3 nothings is nothing. 0, 3 twos is 6. A half, 3 nothings is nothing. 3 halves and then 3 nothings is nothing. And now finally I've just got to add 1. Well adding 1 is pushing up moving it on the y-axis, so that becomes minus a half and one. That becomes zero and seven. And then we've got a half and one, and we've finally got three halves and one. So we've now got our three main points that we can use to draw this graph. Okay, so there's our, there's our four main points, so we can then just note them on the graph. So along minus a half at one, say, we'll just note that minus a half one. 0, 7 along 0 up, say 7. A half 1 along a half up 1. And the final one, 3 halves 1, so along a half 1, 1 and a half. So there's all our points. And then we can just draw a sketch using our original one as a guide. Our well, original 1, 0, 2 is a turning point, the second coordinate, so that's a turning point there. So I'm going to go. If we look, try and look at both at the same time, there it is. I'm going to come up, turn there, go down, turn underneath and go back up. So we can just draw that in. So we're going to go up, turn, down, turn and back up. And obviously on this question, we don't know the coordinates of this turning point. We just know it's in, in between these two. So we just know it and make sure that it's going roughly the correct distance down. But we don't exactly know how far down it's going. So we just leave it there. Exponential functions. Okay, an exponential function is a function form f of x is e to the power x, where x is a member of the real numbers, and so is a, obviously, and a is bigger than zero. So a we call the base, and x is called the exponent. And in higher maths, there'll be a whole topic on dealing with exponential functions, but we're just going to look at graphs a little bit and inverses today, and also logs. On this function here, f of x equals a to the x, where a is the base and x is the exponent. Let's look at some quick properties of exponential functions. If we put x equal to 0 into this function, then you get a to the power 0, and anything to the power 0 is 1. So the point 0, 1 will appear for all exponential functions of this form, a to the power of x. Notice that x is in the power, it's not a, x to the power of a, a to the power of x. And similarly, when you put 1 into this function, you get a to the power of 1. So the point 1a will appear. And if you draw a graph of these points, you'll see that for this exponential function, assuming that a is greater than 1, you've got the point 1, 0 will go through. There'll be another point along 1, which will just be 1a. And it gives you this kind of this curve, this exponential growth curve. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger the more you go along. It kind of gets really steep. But it never ever ever touches zero. So if you extend that back, it would never get to zero. Similarly, if your a was negative, it would start high and it would just drop and it would tail off at one a, and then it would just kind of never ever touch zero. It's called an asymptote. Let's look at this in the in the context of some questions. So pretty simple this stuff. It's just learning these new functions. It says sketch the curve with equation y equals six to the x. What you need to know is that you need to put in x equals 0 and x equals 1 into this function. So when x equals 0, y equals 6 to the power of 0, which equals 1. So the point 0, 1 is going to be drawn. And then when x equals 1, y equals 6 to the power of 1, which is 6. So the other function we're going to, the other point we're going to draw is just 1, 6. So then we draw a nice neat sketch, or as neat as we can, on a bit of blackboard. But usually you would use a ruler and 
you would have squared paper. But we've got the points along zero up one, so I'll just note that is I'll just note that one is one, and then along one and up six. So we'll just kind of put it on and write one six. It doesn't have to be too exact. All you need to know is your shape, okay? Your shape goes along, never touching this line, along, goes through that point, through that point and gets deep. That's it. So we just draw that in nice and neatly and note that that is y equals 6 to the x and we're done there. So since we have got exponential functions in our toolbox, we can go back to when we did graphs of transformations and just do the same for exponential functions. So for example, one says sketch a graph of y equals 1 plus 2 to the power of x. So if I think about just the basic exponential function to start with y equals 2 to the power of x, at y equals 2 to the power of x, I've got two points. When x equals 0, y equals 1, always 0, 1. And when x equals, well, 1, y would equal 2 to the 1, which is 2. In other words, 1, 2. So that would be our basic, very quick sketch would look like that for y equals 2 to the x. Going through the point 1 here and some other point we can just note as 1, 2. So now we need to just think about drawing 2 to the x, but then plus 1. So tran graph transformations, this plus 1 just means I move the whole thing up by 1. So for y equal 1 plus 2 to the x, when x equals 0, y equals, well, it's going to be 2. So we get the point 0, 2. And when x equals 1, y is going to equal 2 plus 1, which is 3. 1, 3. Everything's just shifted up by 1, so we can draw a quick sketch of that graph. And we'll be done. x-axis, y-axis, 0, 1 has become 0, 2, so I'll put it a little bit higher so it's obvious for the drawing. There is 2. And then 1, 3 has become along 1, up 3. So we'll just put it up here and note it's 1, 3. So now if you think, usually it doesn't touch the x-axis, but now it's jumped up, so it doesn't touch 1. We could, you don't have to do this, but you could put a 1 here and, and, and make that your line that it doesn't touch. But as long as you've got your points, you're good to go. And we just note that that is y equals 1 plus 2 to the x. And we're done there. Transformations of exponential functions. A second example, sketch the graph of y equals 3 to the power of 2x. So our basic function, if we think about it, is y equals 3 to the x. Is our basic function. So remember, when x equals 0, y equals 1. Because 3 to the power of 0 is 1, remember. So that gives you 0, 1 as our basic point. And our next basic point is when x equals 1. So y equals 3 to the 1, which is 3. So that will give me 1, 3. So drawing a graph of that is a quick sketch where we get something like that. Noting that that is 1 is 1, 3. And that's remember y equals 3 to the x. So now we need to do y equals 3 to the 2x. So for y equals 3 to the power of 2x, when x equals 0, y equals, well, 2 times nothing is nothing. 3 to the power of 0 is still 1. So it's still the same point. But for when x is equal to 1 this time, y is going to equal 3 to the power of 2. 2 times 1 is 2, which is 9. So the point becomes 1, 9. So drawing that graph, remember that these are graph transformations. So this, I suppose, could be f of 2x instead of f of x. So it's compressed it. So let's take a look at these points. 0, 1 still in effect, so we could just note 1 there. But then 1, 3 has become along 1 and up 9. So we end up with a nice curve that looks like that. And we're done there. Okay, let's start looking at logarithmic graphs, which are the inverse of exponential graphs. So the logarithmic function is the inverse of the exponential function, which will allow you to do logs and exponentials. So we can reflect the exponential graph in the line y equals x to find the log graph. So remember, 
for our exponential function, we had to point 0, 1, so that would become 1, 0. You don't need to understand this at the moment. And But when we had to point 1a, that would become a1. Every logarithmic form like was log ax passes through points 1, 0 and a1. I will briefly explain logs. This is called the base of the log, okay? And the log of log 1 of anything is 0. And the log of itself, same base, a is always 1, okay? And you'll do a whole topic on logs. I'll do a video on it soon where you can run it with it and play with logs. But let's look at the actual graphs of them, just for the sake of completeness for this topic on functions and graphs of functions. Sketch the curve with equation log base 6 of x. So for logs, you're just looking at x equals 1 and x equals a. So when x equals 1, you get log base 6 of 1, which is 0. No, log of 1 is always 0. That's what you need to know. And then we pick the base, which is 6. So x equals 6. You get log base 6 of 6, which is just 1. So our two points are 1, 0 and 6, 1. So the graph of this function, now if this was an exponential, here's how you think of these. We've had exponential graphs already, and if this was an exponential graph, it would be going like this. So since it's reflected in this line here, it just goes like this. It's that kind of mirror of an exponential graph. So we can draw the points. It goes along 1, up 0, so it's always on the x-axis. So it's always on the x-axis. And we can go along 6 and up 1. So let's just note back there. That is the point along 6 and up 1. And our graph just goes like that. Think of this line here, y equals x. The exponential form of that would be like this. But that's not what we're drawing today. So that's the graph of y equals log base 6 of x. And we're done there. Okay, transformation of logarithmic functions. So sketch the graph of log base 5x minus 3. So our standard log graph is going to be y equals log base 5 of x and we've already seen in previous examples that we just sub in some values we sub in x equals 1 so when x equals 1 y equals log base 5 of 1 which is 0 so our point is 1 0 and then we sub in this base so when x equals 5 y equals log base 5 of 5 which equals to 1 so we get the point 5 1 so if we were to draw the graph of log 5x it would be y and x, and it would go through the point at 1, 0, which is here, let's call that 1, and then some other point along 5 and up 1, and it would go like this, and that would be our graph. So, to draw log base 5 of x minus 3, well, that's going to be a shift to the right by 3. I can see that already from my knowledge of graph transformations, but let's just check for y equal to log base 5 of x minus 3. Three. So now looking at this graph, we've got log base 5x minus 3. You can just think of it as a shift to the right by 3 and immediately get the answer. And if you don't know that, then know your knowledge of logs. This number has to be 1. x has to be 1 for this graph because it's log base 5x. But I need this whole bit to be 1. So x has to be 4. 1 plus 3 is 4. It's shifted to the right. So when x is equal to 4, we get y is equal to 0. What? We get the point 4, 0. And then the other thing we want is that we want this number to be the same as that number, which in this case is 5. So I'm going to need x minus 3 to be 5, which means that x has to be 8. So when x is equal to 8, y would equal to 1. So we get 0 0.81. Or in other words, a shift to the right by 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. 5 plus 3 is 8, and we can just draw the graph. So we draw a logarithmic graph, and instead of 1, 0, we've got 4, 0, so let's call that 4, 0. And instead of our usual 5, 1, we've got 8, 1. So along 8, let's just call that 8, 1. Let's just move this along a bit and extend this line. 8, 1. And our graph is still going to go like that. This time, the shift there so that is our graph of y equals log base 5 of x minus 3. That's the of log in front of example 2 sketch a graph of log base 5 2x plus 4. So our basic log graph is y equals 
log base 5 of just x. And so this time when x is equal to 1, y equals 0. We already know this from previous examples. The log of 1 is 0. Then the next one is x is equal to 5 because that's the base. y would equal to 1 because log base 5 of 5 is 1. So our standard points would be 1, 0 and 5, 1. And then we need to know how do those points change by doing 2x and 4. So this is just a functions question, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. I'm thinking about standard one is log base 5 of x. So then it's going to be log base 5 of 2x, my compression. And then it's going to be log base 5 of 2x plus 4. So 1, 0 and 5, 1. Well, 2x from our knowledge of transformation functions already means we compress it so it becomes a half zero and five halves and one. And then adding four on the end means it moves up the y-axis by four. So we get a half. Four is our new point and five halves. Five is our other new point. So we can draw our basic graph of log base 5x and then just shift it to half 4 and 5 halves 5. Very quickly, on this side, we've got 1, 0 and 5, 1. There's 1, let's say 5. Just a quick sketch of that log graph. That's log base 5 of x, just so we can keep our cells right. And then drawing our new graph nice and neatly. This is going to be log base 5, 2x plus 4. So our points were a half 4, so instead of 1, I'm going to go along a half and up to 4, so let's just call that a half and 4. And our second point is 5 halves 5, so instead of along to 5, we're going to along to 2.5 or 5 halves. So let's say that that is a half, 1, 1 and a half, 2, 2 and a half, 5 and a half, and it's going to go up to 5, 5 halves and five. So then it's just a standard logarithmic graph. I'm just going to go round and up like that. Same graph as normal and we're done there. Right, it was p cos qx plus r. So it's a trig graph. Write down the values of p, q and r. Okay so we need to start off with what this function is. The normal cos graph if you remember goes between one and minus one like so and it goes up to two pi. So the number in front is called the amplitude, then the period of how the frequency, and then how far it's moved up or down. So immediately we can see that if we look at the Q first, we've got 1 up to pi over 2, which means if I was to keep drawing that, I would have 4 up to 2 pi, because pi over 2 is 90 anyway. So I can immediately write down that Q equals 4, because I should have 4 of them up to 2 pi. Okay, to get our amplitude, if we just work out the difference between the maximum and minimum, I've got 4 and minus 2 is 6. So to get P, I can just do 4 to minus 2 is 6. Half of that is 3, so I get 3. P is 3. And then for R, well, now I've got P, it's easy. If, if it was just 3 cos X, it would go up to 3, but it starts at 4, so I've added 1. So R is just equal to 1. And we're done there. We'll write down the values of p, q, and r. In other words, the function is 3 cos 4x plus 1. Logarithmic graphs. S. Hi, Mass 2015, paper 1, question 13. The function f of x is 2 to the x plus 3 is defined on r, the set of real numbers. The graph of equation y equals f of x passes through 1b and cuts the y axis that q is shown. What is the value of b? Well, it passes through 1b, so I can just sub 1 in. So for part a, we've got f of x is equal to 2 to the x plus 3. So at x equal to 1, we're going to say that f of x equals 2 to the power of 1 plus 3, which is 2 plus 3, which is 5. So just to answer the question, b equals 5. And we're done there. Part B says copy the diagram above and switch the inverse function and then write down the coordinates of the images of P and Q. What it means by the images of P and Q is 
what does P and Q become in the inverse function? So this is an exponential, so the inverse function is a log, so we need to reflect that in the line y equals x. So let's just go ahead and do that. So I've copied the diagram below. So we already know that P is 1B, which we've just worked out is 1, 5. And then let's work out our y-intercept for this graph. So that is when x equals 0, so f of x, which was 2 to the power of x plus 3. That's 2 to the power of 0 plus 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. So we get 0, 4. We need to reflect in the line y equals x. So drawing a y equals x sign. So 0, 4 becomes a long 4, 0. And 1, 5 becomes 5, 1. And we've got an exponential curve like so. That's the inverse function of x. So that's part 1 done. And then for part 2, oh, I've already done the work for it. The image of P and Q, we've got 4, 0. And we've got 5, 1. And we're done there. Part C says... R311 lies in the graph of equation y equals f of x. Find the coordinates of the image of, of R on the graph of equation y equals 4 minus f of x plus 1. So writing down f of x again. f of x, remember, was 2 to the power of x plus 3. And we know that the R lies on this, which is 311. So our new equation is y equals 4 minus f of x plus 1. So what does that mean? Well, let's just take a few notes. In here, means we move left by 1. Minus f of x means we reflect in the x-axis. And you can think of this, that's like plus 4, so move up by 4. If it helps, you can rewrite this as minus f of x plus 1, and then add the 4 in the end, and you might be able to see that better. So that means we've got our r, which was 311. So doing the things in the correct order, we, we apply our reflection and then we move the left, and then we move up. So our reflection, minus f of x plus 1, 3, 11 becomes 3, minus 11, because it drops down underneath. And then that goes to moving left by 1, so 3 becomes 2, so 2 minus 11. And then finally, we need to move up by 4, so we get 2, minus 7 as our final answer. Now, if you're really struggling with that, one way to do it is to go back to the original graph and actually draw it, reflect it, move it to the left, move it up, and note that point moving around. SQA, hi, I'm 2016, paper 1, question 15, identify a polynomial from its roots. So the diagram below shows the graph of f of x, which is kx minus ax minus b squared. Find the values of a, b, and k. There's one of my roots there. And there's the other root there. That's a repeated root. And I know that because it's a turning point and a root. So that one is my B, and the other one is my A. So I can immediately say for part A, f of x equals k times x minus 4, x plus 5 squared. And then we can use the point 1, 9 to work out our k. x equals 1, y equals 9. So we get 9 equals 1. k times 1 minus 4, 1 plus 5 all squared. So 9 equals k times minus 3. 1 plus 5 is 6. 6, 6 is 36. So 9 equals minus 108k. So k is 9 over minus 108, minus 12. So we've got k as minus a 12. We've got a equals 4, and b was equal to minus 5, remember, from our, 
our roots, 4 and minus 5. So we're done there. Part B says for the function g of x equals f of x minus d, where d is positive, determine the range of values for d so that g of x has exactly one real root. Okay, let's have a look at this. If it's got one real root, it only crosses the x-axis at one point. So this is going to move down, so that makes it go, but it's still going up. So this turning point has to go underneath here. So that the only places, place it crosses is when it first initially drops down. Then it goes up and it's going to turn before it hits there and go back down. Well, that length is 9, so D must be greater than 9, and it's as simple as that. So it's just really working that out by looking. So for part B, I just write D is greater than 9, and we're done there. We have some related functions. This will be high math 2017, paper 1, question 14. First part was a trig question, and then it moved on to having to draw a graph. So for part A, using our knowledge of trig, we have got root 3 sine x minus cos x. And we have to write it in the form k sine x minus a. So we expand that using the formula sheet. That's k sine x cos a. minus k cos x sin a. Okay, so then we would, we would just uh, write, equate the parts to each other. So if we look at the sin x first of all, we've got k sin x cos a, so that means that k cos a equals root 3. So I can just write that, k cos a equals root 3. And similarly, Looking at the cos x part, which is over here, we've got minus k sin a equals minus 1. So we can just write k sin a equals 1. k sin a equals 1. So that means that our k, because sine squared x plus cos squared x equals 1, gives us the square root of root 3 squared plus 1 squared. So that is the square root of 3 plus 1 which is the square root of 4, which is 2. So our k equals 2. And then to get your a, so to get our a, remember sine divided by cos is tan, so I can write tan a is equal to the sine, which is 1 over the cos, which is root 3. So that's an exact value for tan a, because we've got a right angle triangle, and if you had 60 here and 30 here, you would have 2, 1 and root 3. So the tan of 30 is 1 over root 3. We need to use a cast diagram just to confirm. So if we look at our cast diagram, we need to check our original functions. Cos was positive, so that would be these two. And sine was positive, that would be these two. So yes, we're in the first quadrant, because we're two ticks in A. So that means I can just say, therefore, A equals 30 degrees. And then our final answer is 2 sine x minus 30 degrees and we're done there so for part b we we'll have to draw the graph but we've already put it in this form so we're just going to draw the graph of y equals 2 sine x minus 30. so i know my amplitude is 2 so it's going to go between 2 and minus 2 and minus 30 tells me that it's shifted to the right by 30 degrees so drawing a nice sketch of that i can note on the y-axis the points 2 and minus 2 and then we're going to start at 30 degrees because we've shifted along so we can just start drawing our graph and stop about there because it's not it only goes up to 360. We can note our turning point so normally it goes along to 90 but shifted to the right by 30 means that this point is 120 so 122 and similarly, this is usually 270 on a sine graph, so an extra 30 makes 300. So we've got 300 and 2. Uh, the other thing we could do is make sure you go back to 0, so you have to draw what's going to happen here. So it's just going to continue. We could know, notice where it cuts the y-axis. So it's going to cut the y-axis here, which is when x is 0. If you put 0 into this, you get the sine of minus 30, which is minus a half, times 2 is minus 1, so you could note minus 1 there. And there you go, you've drawn a sketch of the graph. You could tidy that up a little bit if you want. We move on to what I would say is unusual differentiation questions. 
Uh, the first one we're going to look at, this stuff that doesn't come up as often, is this one. A quadratic function is designed on a set of real numbers. This was 2017, paper 1, question 15. Diagram 1 shows the graph of y equals f of x with the turning point at 2, 3. And diagram 2 over here shows the graph of h of x and the turning point is now 7, 6. Okay, let's see what it's asking us to do. Part A, given that h of x is f of x plus a plus b, write down the values of a and b. So now words, it's a graph transformation question for part A. So let's have a look to see what's happened. If we look, we look at this point 3, well, let's just look at the turning point, 2, 3, it's clearly moved along to become 7. 2's become 7, it's moved to the right by 5. So if it's moved to the right, then a must be negative. So a is negative 5 because it's moved to the right by 5. And then our b, well, plus b on the end means it's moved, the whole thing's moved up by some number. We started at 3 and we've ended up at 6. 3 plus 3 is 6, so b is simply the number 3. And we're done there. So part b says it is known that the integral between 1 and 3 of f of x is 4. What is the value between 8 and 6 of h of x? Well, an integral means an area. So we know that the area under this bit here is 4. So that means over on this graph, since it's just moved up, this whole area here is also 4. And leaving the extra bit between 6 and 8 is just a rectangle. That is 2 along. And that is, must be 3 because the graph's moved up by 3. 2 times 3 equals 6, so our integral between 8 and 6 of h of x is just 6 plus 4, which equals 10, and we're done there. Part C says, given that f dash 1 equals 6, what's h dash 8? f dash 1 equals 6, let's just use a different colour pen now, that means that the gradient of the tangent at this point here equals 6, and it's asking us, what is the gradient of the tangent at 8? Well, at 8 on h of x, a is this bit here. Now that's, if we imagine looking at this graph instead, that would be this point here. It's a mirror of this, so it's sloping down the way. So it's just minus 6, because it's just the other side of the graph. So h dash of 8 equals minus 6, and we're done there. Solving logarithm equations, s squared high maths for 18, paper 1, question 11. Diagram shows log 3x on the diagram in the answer book. Sketch the curve of equation 1 minus log 3x and then find the point of intersection between the curves which will be solved with logarithmic equations. So 1 minus log 3x, the minus part here tells me to reflect in the x-axis and then the 1 part, which I'll do in another colour here, tells me to then move up by 1. So first of all, reflecting on the x-axis, this point will stay where it is, but this point will jump down here, and that would be at the moment as a, as a point 3 minus 1. But now I have to move up by 1, so this point is going to jump up by 1, so that becomes 1, 1, and you can see this point goes up to 3, 0, so I can just write the number 3 here. Getting rid of my intermediate working, which you could use a rubber if you were doing this by hand and since it's reflected it's going to go down and through here so we can just draw that in down here through the way and there we go it's a reflection in the x-axis okay part b determine the exact value of the point of intersection simultaneous equations so for part b we've got y equals log 3x but we've also got y equals 1 minus log 3x so we can say that they are equal to each other and find x. So log 3x equals 1 minus log 3x. So taking the log 3x to the other side, you'll have log 3x plus log 3x. So two of them, 2 log 3x equals 1. I can take the, power, the 2 up as a power, so I get log 3x squared equals 1. Now I've got it in the form log of something equals a number, so 3 to the power of 1 equals x squared. 3 to the power of 1 equals x squared, and therefore I can find x. x equals 3 to the power of a half, or x equals the square root of 3. And we're done there. Notice it'll only be the positive part of this instead of the 
negative part because if x was negative, then you would have log of a negative number, which doesn't exist, so it's just a positive. I can take a note of that. Just positive value as x has to be greater than zero. So related functions, s squared higher maths 2018, paper two, question eight. So we're starting off with trig and then drawing or stating some values. So for part a, express two cos x minus sine x in the form k cos x minus a. We write two cos x minus sine x equals, expand the right hand side using the formula sheet, k cos x cos a. plus k sine x sine a. And then we equate our left hand side and our right hand side. So looking at the cos x first, the number in front of cos x on the left is 2. What's in front of cos x over here is k and cos a. So we can say that k cos a must equal 2. Doing the same with the sine x. In front of sine x on this side is minus 1. And in front of sine x on this side is k sine a. So we can say k sine a equals minus 1. And remember, to get our k, we just square both numbers and square root them. Why is that? It's because sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. So to get our k, it's the square root of minus 1 squared plus 2 squared, which is the square root of 1 plus 4 which is the square root of 5. So k is root 5. Now to get our a, remember, if we do sine divided by cos, we get tan. So we can immediately write down that tan a equals minus 1 over 2 and solve for a. It's not an exact value, so you get a calculator out to work out the inverse tan of a half. The inverse tan of a half is 26.6 degrees. So using our cast diagram to see what quadrant we're in and we're ready to answer. We need to check it from here, not here. We know the tan A is negative, but cos A is positive. So when cos A is positive, that would be these two quadrants. And sine A is negative, but when sine is negative, it's not these two, it is these two. So it's T and C. And therefore, it's in the fourth quadrant because I'm in two ticks in the fourth quadrant. So that is 360 minus the angle. So I can say that A equals 360 minus 26.6 degrees, which is 333.4 degrees. Now we've got our A and our K. So we can write down our answer as the square root of 5 times the cos of x minus 333.4 three, three, degrees. And we're done there. Part B. Hence, we'll always find the minimum value of 6 cos x minus 3 sin a and find the value of x where it occurs between 0 and 360. We know that 2 cos x minus sin x, we've just worked out, is root 5 cos of x minus 333.4. Three, three, three so the minimum value of that function is minus root 5, because that's your amplitude. But this is now 6, cos, 6 minus 3, so in other words, this has been times by 3. So if I just write that underneath, that means we've got 6 cos x degrees minus 3 sine x degrees. Well, since that's been times by 3, I can just write 3 root 5 and the same cos of x minus 333.4 degrees. And therefore, our minimum value is simply the minus 3 root 5, because it goes between 3 root 5 and minus 3 root 5. And we're done there for that. Part 2, the value for which it occurs where 0 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 360. So we're looking at this part here, which tells us that the whole graph's been shifted to the right by 333.4 degrees. So if we draw a normal cross graph, you'll be able to see what's happening here. Our normal cross graph would go like this. 
and it would stop at fucking 60. And the turning point here would be 180, but we're going to shift that to the right by 333.4. Now that's going to take us outside of our range up to 360. So if I extend this back, then this would be minus 180. So that's going to be shifted to the right by 333.4, which is going to take us into between 0 and 360. So if I just use that fact, I can just say that the minimum value occurs at 333.4 minus 180. So minus x would equal minus 180 plus 333.4, which is 153.4 degrees. And we're done there. Graphs of related functions S3 higher maths 2019, paper one, question 10. The diagram shows the graphs of f and x and k f of x plus a. So f of x is this one here, and k f of x plus a is this one here. State the value of a and find the value of k. So to state the value of a, well, we can't use this because it might have been um, times by a number, the k clearly has, but if you times nothing by nothing, you get nothing. So we can use the zero part, and it's just the distance between here. The distance here is 3, so a is 3. And it's as simple as that. So we know that a is 3. Now we need to find k. So what's happened to f of x? Well, f of x, it should be obvious that it's flipped upside down. So k is negative. And since k is negative, if we just look at this point here, 2 minus, on f of x, 2 minus 1 would become 2, 1. So if I just write 2, 1. But... I'm ending up at 5. If I added 3 onto 2, 1, I would get 2, 4. So I must be doubling 1 first. 2 times 1 is 2 to get me to 2, 2. And then adding 5. So that means that k must be minus 2. The minus tells me to flip it upside down. It then gets doubled to go up to 2. Add on 3 is 5. So it's minus 2. And we're done. It's really higher maths 2021, paper 1, question 11. A function is defined in the real numbers is such that its max value is 8 and the maximum occurs when x is equal to 6. It says the function g is given by g is a 2f of x minus 9. State the maximum value of g. Well, it's been times by 2 then taken away 9. So the maximum value is 8. So it's just 2 times 8 take away 9. 2 8 is 16. 16 take away 9 is 7. So the max value is 7. Part B says a function h is given by h of x is f of x minus 4 plus 5. State the maximum value of h. f of x minus 4 plus 5. So for part, we know the maximum value of f is 8. It tells us in the question. x minus 4 is just a shift to the right, so that doesn't change anything. But adding 5 does, so the max value is just 8 plus 5. 8 plus 5 is equal to 13. And we're done there. That's part 1. Part 2. State the value of x when the maximum value of h occurs. Well, the maximum value occurs for f at 6. It's shifted to the right by 4. 6 plus 4 is 10. 6 plus 4, 10. And we're done there. There. Twenty twenty two higher maths paper one question ten had this diagram of a cubic function f of x and it had stationary points at zero three and four zero and with the sketch graph of two f of x and one. So what's it asking us here? It's asking us to scale it up by a factor of two, so times by two, and then move the graph up by one. So let's do that on a diagram. We have have just drawn this very small here. You can't really see it, but that is the actual question. But it's just so that I can refer to it as we are going. So I've drawn myself a little uh, coordinate grid and we can start off by looking at the points. So the first point we start off with is 0, 3 and we have got to times it by 2. So 0, 3 becomes 3 times 2 is 6 but then we move it up by 1 so it becomes 7. So our first point is 0, 7 and we get a mark for that. And our second point is we're times them by 2, but it's along 4 up 0. So 0 times 
2 is still 0, but then we add 1, so it goes along 4, up 1, so we can note that point is 4, 1. And the shape of the graph is exactly the same as it was before, so we just carefully draw a nice curve turning here, and we can even label it y equals 2f of x plus 1. So our marks for this, you get one mark for a vertical scaling of a factor of 2, which you can see from the graph. By that, we can see that you've done, you've times by 2 somehow. You get another mark for adding 1, so we can see you've moved up by 1. You're getting this from the turning points, really. And then transformations applied in the correct order. So that's the final mark for doing it completely correctly, essentially, because you could have thought, well, we need to add 1 first, then times by 2. Now, if you had done that, 4, 0 would become 4, 1, which would become 4, 2. You would still get a mark for doing both of those things with 4, 2. Similarly, 0, 3 would become 0, 4, which would become 0, 8. It would be obvious you had added 1 in times by 2, but in the wrong order, so you get 2 out of 3 in that case. Part B says, state the coordinates of the stationary points of the graph at y equals a half x. So let's start off with the original graph again. So we're saying that x is being halved, so what does that mean? It means that we can work out that 0, 3 would turn into 0, 3 still, because of half of 0 or doubling 0 still gives you 0. So 0, 3 is still 0, 3. That makes no difference. Now the only thing that's changing is the x. This one was 4, 0, but I want it to be 4, so if I double 4, I get 8, because a half of 8 is 4. So it must be 8, 0 as well. And you just get a mark for actually working that out with no real working required there, just for stating it. QA High Maths 2023 paper 2, question 4. The diagram shows a cubic with stationary points 2, 0, and 0, minus 2. On a diagram in your answer booklet, sketch a graph of 2 times f of minus x. So let's look at this f of minus x. What that means is it reflects in the y axis because minus 1 becomes 1, 2 becomes minus 2, and so on. So if I take a note on this, here, that minus 1 will end up over there at 1, and that 2 will end up over here at minus 2, and this one will stay where it is because it's on the y-axis. But with the times by 2 as well, so on the y-axis, on the x-axis, these are nothing for y equals 0, so they'll not move, but the minus 2 will go down to minus 4. So it's a reflection, so you'll end up with this sort of picture. One. Let me do that more neater on a new diagram. So I've got it sketched out here. So we've got minus 2, we've got 1, and we've got minus 4 down here. And we're going to go up and down and back up. And we're done. There. It's been Claire Master Day. I've went through the whole of functions in higher maths, so every single past paper, and I've hopefully taught you in depth enough the whole of actual functions so you can go away and revise this at your leisure. Take care, stay safe, and goodbye.